welcome to Crossway Stratford this Sunday evening. It's great that you've been able to tune in with us this evening. I hope you feel really welcome. Perhaps stick around afterwards so we can get to know you at Zoom coffee time. And I hope you enjoy the service tonight. This evening we're thinking about a picture really of what heaven is going to be like, what the future for the Christian will be like. I wonder what you think of when you think about the perfect future that you're heading towards, thanks to the Lord Jesus. One of the pictures that the Bible gives us is that of all of the nations gathered together singing praises with one voice. Can you imagine it? Every tongue and tribe and nation united together singing as one praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just listen to these words from Revelation that give us that picture. Behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Oh, 
for Christians will be all of us united together praising the Lord with one voice but we're going to come together now and confess our sins to God I guess with one voice we can't hear each other um, but we could imagine it couldn't we Uh, in our different separate houses and spaces we're going to confess our sins for the ways we haven't acknowledged God and for the ways that we haven't praised him and thanked him this week for all the good he's he's done for us So let's uh, turn now to the words that will be on the screen and confess our sins to our Heavenly Father together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Just listen to these words again that we will sing in eternity. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, who took away our sins, who paid the price for all we'd done wrong. So enjoying the forgiveness that we have in Jesus, let's say the words of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue in prayer together. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the sure and steadfast hope we have in the gospel. Thank you that salvation belongs to you and that you have graciously and mercifully brought us from death to life. We pray, Father, that you'd continue to be at work in our lives, individually in shaping us more into the likeness of our Lord Jesus and corporately in helping us to become more 
and more of a gospel-centred church here at Crossway. We pray, Father, that you'd help us at Crossway to pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to live in harmony with one another and welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. As we look around at the diversity we have at Crossway, help us to be reminded that the free offer of the gospel is good news for all peoples whom you would choose to save. That in Jesus' death on the cross and in his resurrection, we're one body in Christ brought by his blood. Help us, Father, to appreciate and give thanks for the diversity that you've blessed us with at Crossway. Help us to be gracious, understanding and slow to pass judgment as we navigate our cultural differences and better learn how to love and serve one another in this. Guard our hearts from being prideful, self-interested or quarrelsome. Help us not to be those who pass judgment on one another, but rather remember that judgment and salvation belongs to the Lord. Would your spirit be bringing to bear on our hearts what we've been learning in Romans these last couple of weeks? And so would we be more of a faithful witness, pleasing to you here at Crossway. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Father, we do give thanks for the opportunity that we have to meet together physically at St Anne's Limehouse um, next Saturday. Thank you, Father, for your generous provision of this venue on that day and for our gospel partnership with St Anne's. We do pray that this would be a time of great encouragement and upbuilding and that as many of us as possible would be able to meet together safely. We do pray, Lord, that we would be kept safe during this time, that the practicalities of somewhere unfamiliar to us would be planned for and managed well, and that you would be glorified. We do continue to pray, Father, that we would soon be able to meet more regularly together on Sundays, and that you would provide us with a building of our own in due time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Finally, Father, we draw our prayers away from East London and towards our brothers and sisters in Christ across the world in Malaysia. Thank you, Father, that you are sovereign over all and that you are working powerfully to save people from all around the world. Thank you that despite flooding and persecution of Christians, we hear from open doors that five new believers were recently baptised. We do pray, Father, for those five people, that you would be building them up in the Lord Jesus, that you would be their refuge and their hope, and that they may, might be a great witness to all of those around them. We pray, Father, more widely that in Malaysia there would be a relief in the floodwaters and a safe easing of COVID restrictions so that people's livelihoods might be able to be rebuilt and sufferings eased. For the Malaysian church, we pray that you might grow it in number and in faithful witness to you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello and welcome if you've joined us halfway through. It's great that you've been able to tune in this evening. I'm just going to run through a couple of notices for us, dates for the diary, things we can be thinking about. The first is really immediate. We're going to have a question time straight after Jamie's talk this evening. We spent a couple of weeks enjoying Romans 30, 14, being really, really practical weeks. And I'm sure we've got loads of questions about how what God's been teaching us works its way out and applies in our church context. So the Zoom link for the question time is in the description box below. You can join us straight after the service. I'll put questions to Jamie and also the number should be coming up on the screen now that you can text questions into and will be in the description box below as well. All questions are anonymous. We'll try and race through as many as we can. Hopefully it'll be a really helpful time together straight after our online meeting. Uh, secondly, two dates for the diary, Saturdays. First is Saturday the 27th and the second is Saturday March the 20th. The 22nd of February is obviously next Saturday and we've got the opportunity to gather together physically which is a really precious opportunity isn't it in the context that we've we find ourselves in. We haven't been able to see each other for so long and there is the opportunity at St Anne's Limehouse to gather together on February the 27th. We're gonna have an all age service. We'll all be in the same room in a COVID secure way. And if you're able to make that meeting, we'd love to see you there. More details for that meeting at St. Anne's Limehouse on February the 27th and the following Saturday of a physical gathering, March the 20th at St. Helens will be emailed out to you uh, in the next day or two. And by the way, if you don't 
find emails from Yasmin. They might be in your junk box. So do check your junk, see if they've been going there automatically and try and set it up so that you get them into your inbox instead. Brilliant. And the final notice is for Christianity Explored. It's not too late for you to jump on board Christianity Explored or to invite a friend along to really welcoming environment to be exploring the claims of the Lord Jesus, walking through Mark's gospel, asking any questions that you want to. My wife and I uh, kicked that off yesterday. Well, yesterday as I film now, so Wednesday. And we had a couple of people there. It, it was a really great time and it's not too late to sign up. Again, details can be found in the description box below. That's all the notices from me. We're now gonna have our the Bible reading read and, and Jamie's gonna come to, to preach to us. The reading is from Romans chapter 14, verse 13, to chapter 15, verse 7. That's Romans chapter 14, verse 13, to chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbour for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may all, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. Let's pray together as we start. Our Father, we thank you so much for the liberty, for the freedom that we have in and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we praise you even more for the, the unity that we have, that Jesus Christ died to bring us to you and to each other, that we might sing with one voice to your glory. And so we pray tonight that you would help us to understand what that's going to look like in practice for us as a church family here in the multicultural 21st century uh, West here in London. Help us to think these things through and then to be given the resolve to live in the light of them, even when that's hard for us, even when we have to restrict our freedoms, because we do want to be a church that sings to your praise and glory and that with one voice. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a wonderful freedom 
as I've just been praying to the the Christian life. Uh, Jesus Christ died to liberate us. We are not people who need to worry about becoming unclean because we eat certain foods. Uh, We're not people who need to worry that we become unclean because we forget to observe certain special days. Uh, In the passage that we're reading tonight that we just had read to you in verse 14, Paul says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Uh, It doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a pig or a day of the week or anything else. There's nothing in this world, God says, that is inherently unclean as far as he is concerned. The Old Testament represented pictures to help us understand, but in the end, now in the light of the new covenant, those things aren't unclean, he says. And then verse 17, he goes one step further. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Christianity, we need to be clear on this, is not a religion of external cleanness. And it's pretty distinctive among the world religions in that respect. I don't have to wear, you don't have to wear certain types of clothes or, or, or do certain kinds of things with your food to make sure that it's acceptable for you to eat or to grow your hair in a particular way or to have a calendar of festivals and feasts that you must scrupulously observe. It's not a religion of externals uh, in that way. But in this culture that we live in, this uh, individualistic, libertarian culture that that prizes individual rights and freedoms almost supremely and above anything else, we as Christians can easily fall into the trap of missing the fact that there's something even better than freedom from food laws and clothing laws and day laws that Jesus Christ died to achieve. Now, he didn't die... To, to primarily to liberate you from food laws. He died primarily in order to achieve chapter 15, verse six. Do you see it there? The end of our passage that we read just a few moments ago, Jesus Christ died, verse six, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. And when he says together with one voice, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, Jews and every other nation coming together and singing with such a harmony, with such a oneness of voice that it sounds like exactly that, like one voice singing gloriously to God. That is the best thing that Jesus Christ died to achieve. And that is the thing that Paul is pushing for in these chapters. Indeed, that that is the thing that his gospel has been all about. Jew first, then the Greek, Jew first, then the Gentile, brought together to the glory of God the Father. And all of the the nitty gritty details that he's talking about in these verses, like I say, they are pushing together in that direction. And last week we saw Paul's emphasis. He says, I don't want you to be people who, who judge each other. Perhaps your conscience tells you that you do need to still obey some kind of food law and you see someone who's not doing that. He says, don't judge them for that, they're free. But at the same time, don't despise someone. If you are someone who feels you can you can um, uh, eat a pork sausage and you know that they can't because of their conscience, don't despise them. Don't look down on them. Instead, he said, embrace each other, welcome each other, listen to each other, understand each other. But this week, as we move into verse 13 and onwards, we're going to see Paul go one step further than even that. As he says to the Romans, don't. Whatever you do, don't destroy the work of Christ. Last week, in the first half of chapter 14, it was challenging to everyone. Paul says, don't judge and don't despise. Weak, strong, whoever you are, uh, I'm talking to you. But in verse 13 and onwards, for a time at least, what he does is turn the spotlight, as it were, and point it straight at the so-called strong. Those whose consciences are sufficiently robust that they feel a freedom to eat anything, really, that's laid in front of them. 
that they don't feel conscience bound to observe certain days. He starts speaking to them directly and says very simply to them, you guys, you need to be willing to restrict your freedoms for the sake of the weak. Verse 13. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, what does he mean by that? When he says you've got to resolve never to put a a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a a brother or a sister. What what does he mean by that in practice? How is that going to work out? Well, he says, look, you... um, you strong person, yeah, you look at a, a bacon sandwich and you think, brilliant. I mean, you start salivating and, and you go ahead and you eat. Uh, or you see a glass of wine and you think to yourself, within moderation, of course, I, I can drink that and I can enjoy it. Uh, or maybe you think to yourself in more contemporary terms, uh, I don't have to observe veganuary. I'm not morally obliged to go vegan. Uh, Or you think to yourself, I I don't have to sing the old hymns. It's okay if we leave the old hymns behind. We're not committing some sort of um, unwitting heresy by leaving them behind. Or or you think to yourself, I think I probably am allowed to get a a tattoo discreetly uh, um, if that's something I want to do. Uh, Maybe you think to yourself, I am okay to spend my money on on that thing or in that way or to that extent, uh, even if someone else doesn't feel that. I am free. You look at those issues and think, I can do that. But you exist in a world where not everybody feels the same as you do. Another person looks at that bacon sandwich or, or, or looks at a vegan diet and thinks, I, I really am morally obliged either not to eat the bacon or to, to follow the vegan way. Or to, we, we really are morally obliged to keep singing those old hymns. You really shouldn't be getting tattoos. You really shouldn't spend your money to that extent in that way. And Paul says, if that person thinks doing that thing makes them unclean in some way because their conscience tells them that, well, then it makes them unclean. See, that's the place of conscience in the Christian life. And that's what Paul is saying in verse 14. If you look down, he says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. Paul is saying your conscience matters. It doesn't actually matter even if your conscience is, is slightly, you know, is sort of poorly calibrated. It isn't facing in true north, as it were, morally speaking. If your conscience says you shouldn't do something, you really shouldn't do it. It's why I say to people who come to me to, with, a, with a heavy conscience about something, uh, that even if I think they're free to do it, I'll still say to them, you shouldn't do it. If your conscience says no, Don't do it. Don't get into the habit of ignoring your conscience. That's a very dangerous path to start walking down. And so Paul says to these groups of people, particularly to the strong, you need to know you do not exist in isolation. Uh, Because, yes, you're happy to eat bacon, but you live very near. In fact, you're in a church with someone who doesn't feel happy to eat bacon. And so it's not good enough to just walk to church eating your bacon sandwiches or to or to serve bacon uh, sandwiches after the meeting, because you might be happy eating your sandwich, but the other person sees you eating that sandwich. And well, he says, verse 15, he says, if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. By your action of eating, he says, you could grieve or worse, it seems, destroy the one for whom Jesus Christ shed his very blood. Now, again, that raises the question, doesn't it? What does it mean to grieve or worse, to destroy someone? That's what he says in verse 15. And then he says it again in verse 20. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. How could someone eating a bacon sandwich destroy the work of God? I think possibly there are two ways that it could work out. The first is that this person with a a more restricted conscience than you say, they see you doing the thing that they think is unclean. And they, as a consequence, think to themselves, this gospel that apparently liberates this person to do this thing, that can't be right. 
the, the good thing that they think they're doing is thought of as evil. And the person kind of goes that the gospel that they believe, that I thought I believed, it leads you to do things that are evil and wrong. And, and as a consequence, in their grief at what you're doing, they walk away from the gospel because they draw that wrong conclusion because of the actions that you're taking as you flaunt it in front of them. Could be that. Or it could be an alternative, and I think this might be more likely, or at least it's both of these things. The other is that they see the thing that you're doing, and despite the fact that their conscience tells them that they shouldn't do it, because you're there doing it in front of them, and by implication saying you should feel free to do this too, despite the fact that their conscience tells them that they shouldn't do it, they go ahead and they do it anyway. And then they do it again and again in a way that is causing them to fall into the habit of ignoring their conscience. And that, the Bible would say, and I think Paul would agree, is a very dangerous path to start walking down. God has given us our consciences to help us make the right decisions. And if we get into the habit of ignoring our conscience, then increasingly we'll make the wrong decisions in a way that could lead us away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And thus the work of Christ is destroyed. And so Paul says to the strong Christians in Rome, make every effort not to cause your brother or sister to stumble in some way or another. But he puts it more strongly than that, doesn't he? He says, actually, do not destroy the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see at the end of verse 15, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Or verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. And you've got to take those words seriously, haven't you? No one wants that to be the case. No one wants their actions to be the cause of the work of Jesus Christ, the work of God being destroyed. So let's just for two minutes begin to push this into some areas where it might have some relevance in the 21st century. Let's talk a bit more about veganism, because for what has for a long time felt quite a peripheral issue, it has increasingly pushed its way into the mainstream, hasn't it? And let's be honest, with a, an increasingly moral tone to it, sometimes even a kind of religious tone to it. To be vegan is to be right. It is to be righteous. That's the message that we're constantly being told, which does mean increasingly we're going to find people in church. We may even have them who think to themselves to be vegan is to be right. It's to do the right thing. Now, it might be that you think to yourself, it's fine if they want to be vegan, but I don't have to be vegan. The Bible doesn't say anything about me being vegan. It would free, free me up to eat meat if I want to and all the other things that vegans can't eat. But Paul would be saying to us, I think, if that's our position, do not for one second go about mocking those who think it's an important thing to do. Uh, don't go around flaunting your freedom in front of them. In fact, when they come over for food in your house, don't cook meat for everyone else and epoxy little vegan dish for them. Cook vegan for everyone. Don't do something in front of them that might cause them to go against their conscience. Or in this pandemic moment, let's pick up a different issue. Again, I think it's worth being aware of the different consciences that are out there and that will be out there in the coming weeks and months. Because the fact of the matter is, I think, unless something disastrous happens, government guidelines and restrictions are going to start changing slowly but surely over the weeks and months. But as a group of people who have been living under these restrictions for a year, with lots of health warnings attached to them, it's perfectly possible that there are a lot of people whose consciences have been steered in a particular direction as far as their behaviour in the pandemic is concerned. And their consciences may not move at the same pace as the government guidelines and restrictions. So it's possible we may have one group of people in church who feel liberated all of a sudden and are going around um, not wearing masks anymore because you don't have to, government says that, or, or shaking everyone's hand because all of a sudden we can start having personal contact. And they are at every meeting from the earliest point we can possibly do that. And they do that in a way that is making those who are more nervous, whose consciences don't yet say they could shake someone's hands, whose consciences aren't yet clear about going on public transport if they don't feel they absolutely have to, flaunting it in their face in a way that makes them feel as though they need to go against their consciences. I think Paul would say, exercise your freedom by all means, but don't do it in a way that causes people to go against their conscience. Well, what about in the area of politics? 
uh, either in the area of politics and the kind of formal who you vote for or, or more in the kind of the issues that are live in our culture, of which there are many in any one moment. Paul would say, I think, look, never by your actions force people into a place where they have to make or affirm statements that in conscience they can't just because you feel like they ought to. But similarly, I think he'd also say, make it as easy as possible for your brothers and sisters to pursue righteousness and justice, if that's what they genuinely feel like they are doing. Now, I say all of these things, recognising that there is real nuance and discussion that we need to have. There's give and there's take and the gospel needs to underpin everything that we say and that we do. The issues are complicated and nuanced, but the point Paul is making is actually a very simple one. He says, if you're strong in an area, you must be willing to restrict your freedom for the sake of the weak. Because if you won't do that, he says, you are messing with what Jesus Christ died to achieve and you are cutting against the grain of the kingdom of God. That's verse 17, isn't it? The heart of this little bit of Paul's argument. He says very simply, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. To say, I'm going to keep eating. I'm going to keep doing the thing that I'm free to do and I'm going to do it publicly and out loud and proud. I'm going to flaunt my freedom in front of everyone is to say, I think the kingdom of God is fundamentally about food or whatever the issue is. But Paul says the kingdom of God is not about those things first and foremost. He says the kingdom of God is about, did you see it? Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And he says it's not good enough just to acknowledge that, to sort of nod to that reality, but to just carry on as you have been. He says, verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. We've got to listen to each other. We've got to accept each other. We've got to understand each other. We've got to appreciate each other, like we said last week. And then verse 20, he says, as a result of that, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God, but repeating what he said at the beginning, he says, everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Make every effort not to cause someone to stumble or put a hindrance in front of them. Don't destroy the work of Christ. But as you listen to that, you might be thinking, how am I going to find the motivation to do that? And that's where Paul goes next, as he says, do follow in the footsteps of Christ. You see, the problem with uh, flaunting your Christian freedom in front of others is that in the end, it's uh, driven by an attitude that says, me first, me first, uh, my freedoms first, my liberty to express my freedoms and enjoy my freedoms, that comes first. But the problem with that is that's not a fundamentally Christian attitude. You see how Paul sums up a fundamentally Christian attitude in chapter 15, verse one? He says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbour for his good to build him up. That's the behaviour that drives the Christian uh, worldview. It's you first. It's your good. It's your upbuilding. Those are the things that I am most committed to, says Paul. And so you ask, how? Because the me first attitude is so kind of ingrained in who we are as human beings. How do I develop that you first attitude in my thinking when it comes to all of these different issues, when it comes to limiting my freedom? You ask the question, why should I restrict my freedoms for your sake? And Paul says, because, well, because of verse three. He says, for or because Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. 
One uh, commentator on these verses says that at this moment, Paul takes out a theological uh, sledgehammer to crack a nut, as in one of the great understatements of the Bible. He says very simply, for Christ did not please himself. And Paul is quoting here from Psalm 69, a psalm that speaks of a king, King David, who writes it, who is who is utterly, utterly consumed with a passion for the glory of God. In a sense, is a king who says, you first to God, I will do whatever brings glory to you. And that that takes him, well, in its fulfillment in the New Testament, in the ultimate King David, it takes him to the cross. The reproaches that were, were falling on God ended up falling on Jesus Christ, but not for Jesus Christ's sake, but for the sake of those he would save. It is the ultimate expression of you first, because in no sense can you look at the cross of Jesus Christ and think for one second that he put himself first as he did that. Now, he had all the freedom and all of the liberty, indeed all of the power in the world to do whatever he wanted. He did not have to come down from heaven to earth to live as a human being. He did not have to submit to the Roman guards who came to take him prisoner on the night before he was crucified. He could have just blown them away if he'd wanted to. And he did not have to stay up on that cross hung like a criminal as they taunted him and mocked him and said come on down if you will he could have done but he didn't and that's the point that Paul is making Jesus Christ did not put himself first he said you first and so Paul says remember this uh, these words from the Old Testament, Psalm 69, they were written for our encouragement today that we might have hope and endurance as we need. And so he says, keep on remembering, keep on meditating on Jesus Christ. Let him be the fuel that drives your engine, because in the end, it is impossible. I think it's impossible to look at the cross of Jesus Christ, to genuinely take it in, to, to meditate upon it and then to turn away from that reality and say, me first. You cannot gaze on the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and then fail to follow in his footsteps. Because the cross of Jesus Christ with the, the suffering sacrifice for our sake is like the sun that thaws the ice of selfishness, of, of me firstness in our hearts. As we look on it, so it melts away and enables us then to say, I will restrict my freedoms I won't flaunt my freedoms in front of you for my sake, not me first, but you first. You're good. You're upbuilding. They will become my primary concern. Which means, therefore, that Paul is saying, if you want to have a church with a, a variety of expressions of cultural conscience because of a diversity of background and ethnicity and culture and all of those kind of things, if you want that culture in your church, then Paul says the key to that kind of diversity of cultural conscience isn't in the end, first and foremost, things like um, equal representation in every position uh, or equal expression of views at any one point. Everybody gets to have their say and we give an equal portion of time to each different opinion. It's not even a, a kind of culture of, of suppression of one set of views for a while so that another conscience can have prominence or even a culture where there's constant, robust exchange of opinion all the time in a way that can become grinding and, and painful for everyone. Now, it, it may be that at any one time those different things manifest themselves. They may occasionally be the outworkings of a healthy culture that has established itself. But on their own, as a first and foremost strategy, those things will end up only really being sticking plasters on a disease. Now, if you want the antidote, if you want the ultimate medicine that will enable cultural conscience to express itself and exist in harmony together... Paul says you need to have a Christ-centred, cross-centred culture. Remember Christ, who did not put himself first. And then as that happens, so people's hearts will be one and they will follow in his footsteps of putting others first.
Harmony is a beautiful word, isn't it? I mean, even you don't instinctively know the, the meaning, the word just sounds nice, doesn't it? Harmony. But when you do know the meaning, when you understand what it's really all about, it's a beautiful word to, to think about. It, it means, in a sense, uh, diversity and unity brought together perfectly. When you have those two things expressed perfectly, what you get is harmony. And we just love it when we see it. Um, it's, it's like the, the sports team, professional sports team that have trained and played together for years so that there is almost a kind of sixth sense understanding between them as they pass the ball or whatever it is, whatever sport they're playing, as the ball moves between them, there's just an understanding that means the players don't even need to look. They just know where their uh, teammate is and they understand each other's skill set perfectly so that they just work together. It's harmony. And when you see it, it's wonderful. We love it when we see it. We love it when we hear it. Uh, it's, the, it's the orchestra uh, with the conductor bringing all of the different diverse musical instruments together to make a, a beautiful noise together. It's the kind of vocal harmony group with the, the, the bass and the tenor and the, um, whoever else it is all working together, singing the one song, but with all of their different contributions to make a noise that is so much more beautiful uh, than, the, 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 than it would be on its own. Uh, the noise, the, the sound is, as it were, greater than the sum of the parts. Harmony is just wonderful when we see it and we love it as a consequence. And Paul says, if you can live this reality out that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, then harmony is what you will experience. That's verses five and six, where Paul ends this section with a prayer. Do you see it, verse five? He says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, look, I, uh, my prayer for you, I, the, the picture I want to uh, give to you is that of a, well, I suppose, a vocal harmony group. Think of it in those terms. Think of church as being like that with all of your differences because of your different cultures, each of which God values and treasures because he created them. Think of those, those differences as they come together, making a noise that is more beautiful than they would be if they were on their own. You ever thought to yourself, why is it that God has made humanity with so many different cultural expressions, so many different ethnicities? Why did he do it that way? Why didn't he just make us according to one type? Well, it's because he loves harmony. He is in and of himself harmonious, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And now through the gospel, he has achieved that reality as the different cultural groups, Jew and Gentile in Rome and many others across the globe come together to sing with one voice. So the vocal harmony group isn't a bad picture for the life of Crossway Church. And not just because uh, we love to sing, it used to be one of my favourite things to be able to stand at the front of church and look at the collective all there in USS at UEL. So many different types of people from so many different backgrounds singing. I mean, literally singing together with one voice to the glory of God. But it's not just because that was something that we used to do when we could. It's not even because actually, you know, when the prayer meeting happens on Zoom, you get that glorious moment when you look on gallery view and you see all of the different faces. Or even as I have the privilege of doing is you drop in on different small groups and see the different diverse faces that are there. No, it is because in its best expression, Crossway Stratford was a united and diverse group of people singing with one voice in harmony to the glory of God. And of course it still is. It still is. It's just, a, at this moment at least, a more muted version of that reality because of the restrictions that we're encountering at this time. But that's okay because that gives us a moment to assess. It gives us a moment to pause. God willing, things may begin to change in the weeks and months that are ahead. And wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if as we emerged from this current lockdown that we're in, as we moved back into a life that it seems at least some degree more normal and like the life we used to lead. Wouldn't it be wonderful if each of us came back with a fresh resolve 
to live the you first life. Resolve never to put a stumbling block in the way of another believer. And now we have some time to pause and to think and to pray and to resolve that we will be people who live in the line in line with this vision to be people who will follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ in saying you first so that we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ so let me pray that we would now Father, we praise you for harmony. We praise you that you have created the world, that you've created humanity in such a way that means that when the gospel goes to work in our hearts and melts the selfishness so that we can say you first, there is a glorious harmony that flows out from that. Lord, we thank you that as a church in so many ways we have experienced that. We know it's not, it's not perfect. We don't get it right all of the time. We have our flaws, our failings, our imperfections, and we ask for your forgiveness but we ask for that forgiveness, not just because we need it, but because we know it's the reality that melts our hearts to enable us to start again. And so we pray even now in this current situation that you would help us to be people who work together to sing with one voice to your glory. And that whatever the future holds, as we emerge into it, Lord, so we would do with a spirit of unity in our diversity that we might enjoy harmony. And we ask it for your namesake. Amen. Thanks for preaching for us, Jamie. We're going to read some words from the Bible before we sing one last time. And these words are from Isaiah. And they're again a picture of this future that God has in store for his people. A future of all of the nations coming together. Uh, Join in where it says all. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths.
Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much that the gospel is so powerful to save. We thank you that it it can save anyone who trusts in it. We thank you, Father, that you have a plan in eternity for people from every tribe and tongue and nation to come before your throne and sing praises to you, for you are worthy. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Father, we thank you for that future that we look forward to. And we pray, Father, that by your mercy and grace, you would help that future, in a sense, to start now at Crossway, that we would begin to reflect that future plan as a people gathered together from so many different backgrounds, every tribe and tongue and and nation and language, uh, standing uh, before you, praising you and loving one another. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, do join us for the question time that we're going to have in just a minute. Details for that are in the description box below. Now let me finish with some words from Revelation. This is what people from all tribes and peoples and languages will sing together in one voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour and power and strength. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour and power and strength. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God.